Hello and welcome to another in our series of videos focusing on the labour market. This is the second video looking at the economics of trade unions. Unions are any organised group of workers who uh, act together to represent and protect the rights of workers, usually by operating with collective bargaining techniques. In this session, we're going to focus on how unions can impact on wages and jobs in the labour market. Here's a quick reminder of some of the biggest unions in the UK. The two biggest trade unions are both in the public service sector, Unite and Unison. Total union membership in the UK is around 7 million workers, although that's less than a quarter of the employed labour force. Some unions have more clout, have more impact than others in terms of bargaining for higher wages. So let's work through some of the analysis diagrams you might be able to use in the exam. Uh, to use the, this analysis, start off with a simple labour market diagram showing the wage rate, for example, the hourly wage uh, on the y-axis and employment on the x-axis. And we're going to assume initially that the, if you like, the free market wage has settled at a wage rate of W1 with E1 workers employed. Now, it could be the case uh, that unions manage to negotiate, negotiate a higher wage using collective bargaining. I'm going to ignore here the possibility of the closed shop where unions restrict um, members, people who can work in a particular job to recognise union approved union members. The Employment Act of 1990 made closed shops agreements in the UK illegal. So we're going to focus here solely on the ability of a union to negotiate higher pay with the employer. So in our diagram, uh, the union has negotiated a wage of W2, and that can now be introduced into the analysis diagram. Well, what's that going to do? For those people who have a job, uh, members of a union, they're going to get a higher wage, they're going to get paid W2. However, other things being the same, or Keter's Paribus, the level of employment will contract from E1 to E2. Wages are higher than they were before. Some firms may decide to replace, for example, labour with capital machinery. So the shaded area in blue here shows the higher wage income from the union collective bargaining, the union's bargaining at the wage to W2. So that's the increase in wage income compared to the previous wage. However, employment has also fallen. So there's been a fall in employment. Let's just put that in here. A fall in employment shown in the shaded area from the contraction in employment. So trade unions may bid up the wage, and we call this the trade union wage premium or the wage markup, above the normal competitive wage. But this can lead potentially to an excess supply of labour and a contraction of employment. So we have two areas here. We have the blue area showing the higher wage income from collective bargaining. In this case, more than offset by the decline in employment shown in the grey area as employment contracts from E1 to E2. So here's the key evaluation point to help your analysis. Whether or not higher wages achieved by trade unions from their collective bargaining leads to the total income of, of workers to go up depends on what happens to employment. In other words, it depends on the elasticity of demand for labour. Unions will tend to have more success in lifting the wages or the total incomes of their members if the demand for labour is relatively inelastic. In my example, the demand for labour is relatively elastic and the fall in employment more than offsets the increase in wage income. Now, unions, their bargaining strength depends on how many of the workers they represent in a given occupation. So trade unions tend to be more influential when they represent a very high percentage of all the employees in a particular industry or occupation. This analysis assumes that productivity has stayed the same. It's possible for unions to negotiate higher pay and maintain employment. Uh, if they, for example, ad uh, agree a productivity-related pay deal. So, if, for example, an employer might say, well, we'll pay you 4% more this year 
uh, providing you can guarantee an increase of, let's say, 3% of, of labour productivity. Now, what's the extent to which trade unions in the UK do exert a wage premium? This chart shows the hourly, average hourly wage of union members as a percentage of the average non-members hourly wage in the UK. In other words, do unions have a premium wage? And the answer is yes. On average, workers in trade unions have a, a wage premium of around 15% compared to non-members hourly wages. Now, whether or not you think that is significant is, is up to you to decide. Uh, but clearly, uh, there is a wage premium for some trade unions. They do use their collective bargaining to negotiate higher pay. But keep in mind that unions are a relatively small share of the labour market in, the, in 2017. Only 25% of people in a job are members of a union. And I think there's, there's some evidence that the wage premium to trade union membership has come down over recent years, in part driven by globalisation and the rise of flexible employment contracts. So we've been through the analysis of how trade unions can potentially increase the wage of their members through collective bargaining. But the downside risk for them is that they, if they bid the wage up too high, we end up seeing a contraction of employment and total wage income might actually fall.